This is Neon Galactic, a YouTube podcast produced by PBS affiliate Key TV. I am your host and fellow traveler, James Falk. If you like these conversations, please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Show the world that these are the kinds of conversations that need to be had. Most of all, thanks for joining us. Even as Western civilization has progressed through the well-recognized intellectual eras of our collective evolution, from that of the Greek philosophers, their Roman descendants, then the occasionally mystical refrains and often choking yoke of the Catholic Church, on through the Reformation and ultimately even the Enlightenment, there has also been a current of hidden or occult knowledge that developed right alongside these institutional thought streams. These other occult or left-handed paths often speak of secret truths, magical power, hidden masters, extended life, and transcendence. One of our difficulties today, under the influence of a materialist physicalism, is determining which of these claims are meant to be metaphorical, which may be fraud, fantasy, or delusion, and which speak of actual factual assertions. Mystery schools, Merkava, Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Alchemy, Kabbalah, Magic, Theosophy, Thelema, and more speak of both the acquisition of psychic power and the development of self. They also maintain that reality is a lot stranger and more nuanced than we've all been led to believe. Our guest today, author Mitch Horowitz, is a preeminent scholar of the occult and of esotericism more broadly. His recent book, Modern Occultism, takes the reader through the history of these various individuals and intellectual schools, painting the portrait of a vast and vibrant area of human thought and achievement that remains underappreciated and largely misunderstood. He's here today to help us achieve some modest level of understanding and to share with us his views on the nature of humanity, the universe, all the powers that populate and propel creation, while also helping us connect all this back to my favorite subject, the existence of non-human intelligences and their supposed interaction with humanity here on Earth. Thanks, Mitch, for coming on the show. Thank you, man. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so um, as I was explaining before the show started, I got into uh, sort of esotericism and, you know, the related subjects more broadly through my interest in UFOs. Uh, I had no idea that they were related at first. And then through reading the work of Peter Lavenda and others and um, just kind of uh, dipping my toes into the topic, a whole universe opened up. And you seem to be uh, one of the uh, premier experts on that side of it. And so I'm really glad that you were able to join us today and it can hopefully help us, um, you know, parse some of this information and figure out what's, you know, real or or not, or what does it real even mean, right? <laughs> but um, so, I mean, you're obviously a very intelligent guy. Um, my question first off is how did you get into these subjects rather than something that might be more, you know, acceptable to the mainstream intellectual world. And, um, you know, um, yeah, that's basically it. Sure. Uh, you know, it, it, one always likes to chart a beeline of purpose through life, but I suspect to some extent we look backwards and we project purpose onto accident. Uh, it's probably a malady of human nature. Uh, I, I certainly was very deeply interested in occult and esoteric subject matter. But when I was a kid, I was fascinated with Bigfoot, flying saucers, uh, the paperbacks of Carlos Castaneda. Um, I was interested in topics like newspaper astrology, not just from the perspective of whether such things can be true, but how such ideas managed to survive uh, across the centuries from ancient Mesopotamia to 20th century Queens, the borough in New York City where I grew up. So these things were always an interest to me. Um, in adulthood, I suppose is where the accidents started to occur. And and <laughs> some of them, although they were painful at the time, uh, as, as, as is often the case, later turned out to be happy accidents. Um, I was working as an ed I was in book publishing for a time and I was working as an editor at a political press and I couldn't find any traction there. And after about two years, I got fired. And it was a it was a it was a crushing a disappointment on many levels and and very embarrassing and, and personally difficult for me. Um, I looked for new work and uh, 
lots of doors swung halfway open, but the only door that swung all the way open was a job as an editor at a New Age Press. And I went there um, and people kind of treated me as if I was in the hospital and I was recovering. But in fact, I grew enchanted with the material that I discovered there and that I found on the backlist. And rather than uh, cast about for some more august uh, position, I decided uh, that uh, Lucifer is really correct, that it is better to rule in hell than serve in heaven. And I, I, I think arguably that statement was probably first made by um, Julius Caesar. Um, but in any case, I um, grew very attached to and aroused by the material that I discovered there. And I felt that it hadn't been given proper due in the intellectual culture. I felt that the lives of um, occultism's modern forerunners and progenitors and, and uh, most vibrant actors were not being properly written about. And in short, that's what gave birth to my first book, Occult America. So um, let's hear it for uh, accidents, you know, let's hear it for perceived setbacks, because sometimes they can deliver you to exactly where you need to be, or at least they seem to. Well, I mean, you know, accidents or fate, right? I mean, that's like we're all kind of caught in uh, a reality where we're not sure what's programmed and what's not. So uh, given your effect that you've had on a lot of people, maybe maybe it's actually fate, right? We can hope. Um So, you know, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, uh, belief about like, uh, whether or not I mean, I guess one of the things that boils down to is what do you believe about the occult? I mean, that's one place I want to start. I uh, you, you do a lot of I've done a lot of research and you um, you know, there's a lot of things that are outside of what has been allowed to be possible by the physicalist sciences that we all uh, kind of um, have been, you know, inculcated in or, or whatever. Um, so, I mean, what where does your belief fall in terms of the subject and um, how do you, um, you know, deploy that belief in your life? I believe um, absolutely. And I, I consider it a very warranted belief that there is an extra physical dimension to life that our psyches, which I see as a comport of intellect and emotion have participate in an extra physical non-local element. Uh, we not only have testimony to that effect from seekers across literally millennia, from every uh, culture and civilization whose communication in one form or another has endured, but in fact, uh, we have so much bulletproof laboratory evidence of this that the only place you won't discover it is Wikipedia, which is under the thumb of physicalist, uh, materialist um, activists. And in fact, the evidence I'm speaking of emerges uh, from almost, mm, at this point, a uh, hundred years plus of academically based parapsychology, where we have replicable, bulletproof, unpolluted laboratory experiments that absolutely demonstrate anomalous transfer of information in a laboratory setting without respect to time, mass, space. Um, and these things have been performed according to the standards of world-class science. Uh, they comport with insights that have emerged from uh, another century of study into quantum mechanics and quantum theory. Um, fields ranging from quantum theory to neuroplasticity to mind-body medicine uh, to a wide and vast range of experiments and data emergent from psychical research confirm, um, I think, beyond any reasonable question that there is a non-physical aspect to the psyche, which places us as a 21st century human community into a peculiar position because modernist intellectuals have tended to regard religion or extra physicality or spirituality as anathema, which is peculiar because the whole basis of modernism as a philosophy is that life is composed of unseen antecedents. So in Freud's worldview, that, that consists of neuroses and childhood traumas. Um, for Einstein, it's time space. Um, for Marx, it's uh, 
uh, economics. Uh, for Darwin, it's a orderly biological evolution of life. The whole modernist project is dedicated to finding unseen antecedents with the exception of the extra physical. It's a peculiar and outlying cultural, culturally driven exception to the modernist mindset. And it's very deeply cemented in the modernist mindset. Hence, we have this weird situation where world-class and replicable evidence exists for extra physicality, and yet, and yet, a, a kind of materialist philosophical outlook prevails in most of uh, news media and journalism, most of academia and reference material, Wiki in particular. So I often say that the rejectionists have won culturally but they've lost intellectually. And it's gonna take us probably another generation to kind of catch up. Um, you will hear uh, howls of protest uh, from materialists listening to the point of view that I've expressed. And they will say things that they, I suppose, believe. I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my limits of understanding human nature are reached when I'm dealing with people who will make claims like there's not a shred of evidence, none of it's replicable, it's been discredited, none of that's true. And I walk through all of that with great clarity and references that anybody is free to check and call me out on in books like Daydream Believer, Modern Occultism, lots of articles that I've written. Um, the materialist position has failed intellectually. It has succeeded culturally. So that's where we find ourselves. We're sort of straddling um, between these two different facts of life, and it's going to take some time before all this evens out. But that is, you know, to answer your question, that's the standpoint of my uh, outlook. I refer to myself as a believing historian because I take seriously uh, the warranted belief in extra physicality. Yeah, I mean, so I guess I'd ask you, do you believe that's changing? I was speaking with Bernardo Castrop, the philosopher who used to work at CERN, and um, he was a high, you know, high, highly placed scientist, successful. Um, and uh, he says that in some corners of, you know, the practicing science world, as opposed to the sort of armchair uh, commentating uh, scientists, that there is movement on that front and that people, because of uh, developments in quantum physics and whatnot, that uh, people are starting to wake up to the idea that there may be an underlying, you know, deeper reality that we don't typically encounter. Um, but do you see that yourself? And I mean, to hear that it might take a generation to catch up. I mean, that's where it seems like this whole argument, you know, hangs is like, can we get people to re-examine the evidence of their senses and, and of their, you know, inner reality to find this spiritual realm? I mean, that's that's discouraging if it's going to take a generation. So could it happen oh. faster? And what do we need to get there? I don't want to discourage anybody, but I, <laughs> I, I don't harbor a lot of uh, faith in human nature. So I tend to be conservative about the amount of time that these things take. I do agree with Bernardo. Thanks to his work, we are seeing progress. In fact, I often tell people that if anything that I'm saying or any examples as I'm offering as an object seem far out, just get yourself a subscription to that Journal of Occult Passion, Scientific American, where <laughs> things that are, in fact, a great deal more far out than what I'm describing, some of them written by Bernardo and, and colleagues of his. So there has been movement. I mean, and what I'm saying is literally so. You can pick up any random issue of Scientific American or New Scientist or what have you, and um, you can read very solid accounts of um, debates and findings within the quantum physics field, uh, among others, and 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 you will find arguments that sustain extraphysicality, non-locality. Um, the interpretation of these topics is still controversial and will remain controversial for a while. I do think there is progress. Ten years ago, I might not have said that, but the openings are so broad. Here's a sign of progress. You know, you may recall that years back, there was a movie called What the Bleep, which was a spiritual interpretation of quantum theory. And Yeah, and people went crazy. Skeptics were like, oh my God, it's all a lie. <laughs> it's a lie. It's garbage. At best, the critics would say, at best, you know, the New Agers are just cherry picking from material that they don't even understand and they're sustaining all this bullshit. Um, that would be one of the nicest criticisms. I mean, the pushback was intense 
And I remember I published a book called One Simple Idea, which was the history of the positive mind movement. And um, I ventured uh, arguments relating to quantum theory towards the end of the book. And there was great hostility to it. I, I couldn't talk about it on NPR. I couldn't talk about it on news shows. The pushback was extreme, as if I was talking about, uh, you know, Santa Claus and fairy dust and so forth. And that pushback has quieted, it has muted, it has grown milder. And that is not because the critics themselves have grown uh, more sensitive or more pensive or, uh, you know, uh, you know, attenuated to media speak or anything of that sort. Um, it's that the argument has so broadened that it's now occurring more publicly in scientific uh, journals and popular magazines that reliably relay material from scientific journals, whether it's uh, the science section of the New York Times or GASP, even the Guardian, uh, or, <laughs> or or whether, you know, it's Scientific American or what have you. So, you know, that's a sign of progress. You don't encounter that kind of pushback anymore because it, it has fallen out of a fashion. Fashion shouldn't be the fulcrum for our pursuit of truth, but it's fallen out of fashion because of people like Bernardo Castrop and, and other working physicists who are relating this material to the public in, in jury journals and magazines, and it trickles down, and it does make a difference, and it has made a difference. But culturally, it's going to take some time because people will hang on to um, well, look, you know, we identify with our point of view uh, yeah. to the point where it almost feels like self. And I also think one of the one of the problems of our culture is that we elevate questions of agreement and disagreement to this pinnacle of of selfhood and self perception. Absolutely, why should disagreement or agreement be be so critically important? You know, it it it's. It's why we have these overwhelmingly polemical arguments that just get us nowhere because they're all very emotional and emotions decide a lot of things in our lives. Yeah. And I mean, we tend to classify people based on their opinion and whether or not they're in our group or not. And that just leads to more and more division. Social media worships opinion. And uh, like you said, it just leads to, to more and more division and less uh, of an ability to empathize with other people, even though they may be great people, you're only seeing the thing that you are, you know, um, that you've opinionated and vice versa. Yeah. Um, what is magic? I think magic is ritual and method designed to harness extra physicality. And as such, I honor magic. I participate in magic. I perform magic. I do think that there are rituals and methods that the individual can use, such as prayer itself, um, which I define very broadly, but such as prayer itself to try to enter some relation with these extra physical capacities. Are there extra physical intelligences? Are there other intersections of time, other dimensions? Um, with uh, beings to whom we can enter into some sort of relationship or a petitionary relationship. These sound like outrageous questions for our 21st century digital age. But in fact, I would say a majority of people from all walks of life, including the hard sciences, harbor these questions. I simply, I endeavor to give voice to them and to participate in them. But I think magic is a perfectly legitimate methodological effort at uh, harnessing or relating to uh, qualities of extra physicality. What is the mechanism for the actualization of the magical intent? Um, do you think it's because that there's like a resonance between an individual's consciousness and the overall, uh, you know, universal reality or, or how would you, how do you consider it? I, I don't, <laughs> I think, speaking from one perspective, we do need in our generation a theory of extra physicality, a theory of mind causation, a theory of precognition, a theory of ESP. Um, these 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 things I think start to integrate with the UFO thesis, as as you were alluding uh, at the top of the show, yeah. and. I think that, that that integration is to be encouraged. I think that that integration is an idea whose time is upon us. Now, 
and I'm going to say something very concrete, but 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 just to finish this beat, um, it has been argued that Western science overvalues theory. William James and the pragmatists put data above theory. Richard Feynman, although he was a real opponent of the very material that we're talking about, and I think I think blindly so, wonderful man, wonderful intellect, great scientist, great humanist, but he was he was just running he was hanging around in the wrong neighborhood and he picked up the <laughs> wrong friends and, and and i think that if he were alive today he would be more receptive to some of this material but Feynman too in the great tradition of pragmatism would chastise students and colleagues for being overly attached to the theory uh, above data yeah. so if the data is there, then you're shaking hands with reality, whether you got a theory or not, or whether your theory is very pretty or not. Exactly right. People, if they don't have a theory, they excuse it. I mean, they right. they want they want to make it go away because it's inconvenient for right. that theory. You know, there's no theory. It doesn't fit with my theory. You know, mm -hmm. I knew. <laughs> um, it's like you know, uh, writing a book proclaiming, you know, the 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 continuance of the Cold War and then the Berlin Wall falls. And, you know, oh god yeah. damn it, it doesn't matter if the Berlin Wall has <laughs> fallen. You know, I've I've proven that the Cold War is continuing. Yeah. Um anyway, I I do think though that <sighs> theories do help uh when we don't over inflate their importance. They do help us have discussions, debates, frame ideas, and we are overdue for a theory of ex of 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 psychical extraphysicality. And as a lay person, I make an effort to articulate such a theory in my books, Miracle Club, Daydream Believer, and most recently, Modern Occultism. That said, in terms of hardcore practicality, um, I referenced earlier that so much of what we experience in life, whether it's decisions about money or science or anything else, it are based emotionally. I mean, the world is just overwhelmingly ruled by emotions. It does seem to me that emotional passion um, is, is absolutely critical when trying to approach some experience of the extra physical that's um, often the uh, some of the power behind magic right i mean like to invest it with emotion without question yeah and a lot of people have difficulty getting to that state of emotion i think we as a culture have uh underestimated the difficulty of harnessing working oneself into an emotional state J.B. Ryan, who was the great parapsychologist at Duke University starting in the 1930s, he's a, a, a real intellectual hero to me. J.B. conducted literally hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of trials um, for ESP, um, psychokinesis, PK, and other um, things related to psychical research. And he was very conservative about not extrapolating beyond the boundaries of his data. But he did make one small observation that I found revolutionary in the afterword of all places to a British edition of his monograph, Extrasensory Perception, which came out in 1934. And JB made the observation, which was later picked up on by Carl Jung, who echoed it. He made the observation that when ESP is being tested for in a laboratory setting and you're using stats as a as a measure. The stats invariably spike when the subject is in a good mood, is enthusiastic, is engaged, when there's a feeling of comity, uh, good humor, hopeful expectancy in the lab. And when boredom sets in, uh, distraction sets in, when there's a prevailing feeling of negativity or fatigue, the the scoring in, invariably spikes. And if the individual steps away, has some caffeine, does this, does that, has a smoke, whatever, um, the scores raise again. And 
you know, JB made the observation that hopeful expectancy seems to be the a turnkey to results if there are going to be any results at all. And this this has comports with findings in other fields. The placebo response itself is based entirely on hopeful expectancy. That's the trigger as to yeah. whether some therapeutic effect is going to appear uh, or not. And the question of how to harness this hopeful expectancy or or drum it up is central to the magical operation, for example. Rituals are supposed to bring us into that, that state of drama. Prayer is supposed to bring us into that state of drama. Scripture itself says, believe that you have received and, and so you shall. So I think this idea of hopeful expectancy and finding mechanisms, methods, personal states in which that can be brought to the situation, that is without question, um, a critical facet of the experience. If that's not there, nothing will be there. Hopeful expectancy is so frowned upon in our culture right now. It's seen as like naivete, you know, like if you're not jaded or, uh, you know, convinced that the world is going down the toilet, then you right. don't belong. And that's uh, really unfortunate. There are uh, various types of magic. Um, and, uh, which one do you find to be more effective? And then also the role of ritual. Uh, is that a necessary element? I mean, I read in uh, Modern Occultism, you were talking about how ritual sometimes is used to sort of get the attention of beings or the power uh, beyond the veil. Um, what purpose does uh, ritual serve in magic? And um, that seems to be often the dividing line between the various uh, strands. I mean, what? yeah, give me a you know zoological a view of which is more effective uh, method. I personally vector towards simplicity. Um, I <clears throat> I personally do not have a taste for thickly rendered ritual. Um, might have something to do with my childhood. I grew up in an observant Jewish household. I had a Orthodox bar mitzvah. If you like ritual and observance, boy. Judaism <laughs> is for you. Um, and it does deliver, obviously, a lot of meaning to a lot of people. Sure. But I discovered in my 30s that congregational spirituality, ritual, although I abide its beauty and I abide its vintage and, and not quite antiquity, because there's very little that reaches us from antiquity, but I abide its vintage, I abide its, its, its beauty and its meaning for a lot of people. It's not that way for me. I prefer a more freewheeling approach. I have been very interested in the methods of uh, new thought, which is the umbrella term for mind metaphysics or mind causation um, since maybe around the 1890s. It's not a widely used term, um, but it more or less emerged as the umbrella term for the mind metaphysics um, experiment, if you want to put it that way. I really, I like impromptu things. Um, I even wonder if we uh, uh, as individuals can reach a warranted a belief in extra physicality that in itself might serve to simplify things, uh, might serve to, well, I'll put it this way. William James made the observation that belief increases effect and this has been validated across numerous fields james as it happens was specifically speaking within the religious paradigm when he made that statement and i think that insight is absolutely valid and true and right and if the individual has a warranted belief in the extra physical capacities of his or her own psyche that might really simplify things again we're kind of touching on the hopeful expectancy question and this is among the reasons i spend so much time writing about and distilling psychical research which i i do very extensively in modern occultism and daydream believer and elsewhere i'm really down with uh, rendering this material canny, believable, accessible, heavily um, and meticulously referenced. It's probably a quest of my own. It's probably a quest of my own to believe it, you know, yeah. and, and to help the public believe it. William James, who's another intellectual hero of mine, used to bemoan the fact that unlike some people around him, and James experimented with some of the very methods 
that I'm describing. He said, you know, I'm, I seem to be one of those people whose psyche just can't allow the door to fly off its hinges and allow in all these different influences. And I'm exactly the same way. For better or worse, I have a very analytic mind, despite the fact that some of my beliefs might strike some people as far out. I tend to take a methodical ipso facto analytic approach to things. So it helps me. I'm not a big experiencer. I've had experiences and some of them are very cool, but you know, they're not exactly the equivalent of parting the Red Sea, but they're mm -hmm. they're experiences that I've logged and that that I've noted. But but um for me as someone who's not a big experiencer, it's really helpful to have that analytic roadmap. And um, I think that if we can get down with the warranted belief of extra physicality, we can take serious steps towards simplifying ritual magic prayer across all facets of life. I think we come that much closer to realizing an additional capacity that's present, albeit erratically, but present and actual and occurring within human nature. What do you think of, uh, you know, sort of the uh, mass uh, audience, uh, um, the the law of attraction, you know, the secret, the the idea that we manifest our own um, sort of our own universe and that we have the power to draw to us both what we uh, desire and what we fear? Do you think that that figures into this or is that um, pulp material? Oh, no, I think it figures into it. I mean, I don't use the terms myself, law of attraction and manifestation, simply because I have a different outlook as to what I think is going on. Um, my problem with law of attraction is that, at least colloquially, it connotes that we all live under this one mental super law. And that is not my perspective. I, I think that we live under a complexity of laws and forces. And if there is, for example, a law of mind causation, um, that law, like other natural laws, is going to be conditioned by what's happening around it. Gravity is a natural law, but gravity is conditioned by mass. I don't see any natural law, even if it's even if even if what we refer to as consciousness is the ultimate arbiter of reality. We on this plane of existence experience it as as one among many different laws and forces. It's, it's not the only game in town in terms of our lives. There's physicality, there's accident, there's geography, there's natural forces. There, there, there are all kinds of, of forces that are, that are intertwining and affecting one another in our experience. So I tend to avoid that term. I don't use the term manifest. I, I find it inexact. I use the term select. Uh, part of my outlook is that we, our psyches are in effect, well, let's put it this way. What are our senses but tools of measurement? They're tools of measurement. Touch, sight, perspective, smell, taste. We use these things to negotiate life. They're necessary. It is entirely possible that through perspective and measurement, um, the psyche is maybe constantly, constantly selecting among different possibilities and actualities. This comports with the many worlds uh, interpretation of quantum data, for example, which has been with us since the, the late 1950s. I think that there's tremendous insight there that can't be logically avoided. It could be, it could be um, that our psyches are selecting among different possibilities, different iterations. It may feel as natural as taste itself. We don't feel like we're moving among all these different possibilities, but it could be that that's the basis of the human situation. So I tend to use select. Um, at the same time, I must say the following. Um, I've written critically of the secret and the law of attraction uh, in the past, um, but I'm less critical of it nowadays because I'm sick of this uh, perpetual backlash against the secret. The thing came out in 2006. I mean, we're coming up on 20 years, and uh, it's time, you know, to get a new punching bag, um, or to question why you so desperately need a punching bag. I can't tell you the numbers of people I encounter within the spiritual culture whose first statement to me is what crap and what garbage they think the secret is, and how they loathe 
law of attraction and manifestation. It's all just an expression of airsat's seriousness. It's pissing yeah. downward to try to differentiate oneself from these aspects of new age culture that thinking people are all supposed to hate. And I think that's bullshit. And I think that's yeah. a lot of uh, insecurity, not infrequently on the part of people who rush to say those things, most of whom have never seen or read The Secret. Um, yeah. I rewatched that movie a few years ago with one of my kids because, uh, you know, time passes and memories fray. And I thought, um, is it really so hate worthy? And I watched it. And for God's sake, um, everybody talks about, you know, we shouldn't be manifesting a Mercedes Benz as the end of spiritual practice. There's no Mercedes Benz in the movie. There's none of, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't even in there. And um, I thought the values were just fine. I have no, um, uh, fundamental problem with Rhonda Byrne, the maker of the movie. I have criticized Rhonda um, uh, publicly. I have written articles uh, critical of her approach. I differ from Rhonda's approach. I, I I have a very different view of what she calls law of attraction, but at the same time, I also share some of her point of view, and I also applaud her, quite frankly, for um, taking a set of ideas that were new to her and new to a lot of the, the global population and packaging them in such a way that could reach millions upon millions of people who, rather than engaging in ruinous behavior, which I've never encountered, and I've been doing this for a long time, um, maybe uh, she got them thinking about new possibilities, new ways of using their minds or their psychology. So I, I refuse to join that bandwagon, that chorus, against such ideas and expressions, even as I have my own criticism of them and my own um, vocabulary and approach. Yeah, it seems to be like the uh, favored way to um, attack someone whose views are outside the mainstream is to say that they are, you know, uh, an avowed follower of the secret or whatever. Um, Travis uh, Taylor from Skinwalker Ranch, think what you might about him. One of the attacks that people say is, oh, yeah, he's on the Internet talking about, you know, manifesting. So therefore, we need to dismiss everything that he says or stands for, despite his his many degrees and everything else that he's done in his life. Um, you mentioned something, the whole manifesting Mercedes Benz. That's an interesting um, question to me. Uh, there's, it seems like in all the reading that I've done uh, about, you know, a spiritual practice, it's about um, sort of reigning in the self or the ego, at least, and figuring out how to um, develop yourself and develop a sort of um, an ability to um, quiet the mind and to go within. Um Magic sometimes has the reputation, uh, and there are certain characters within the history of magic that seem to have been sort of selfish operators. Although after reading your book, I now know that Aleister Crowley is way more complicated than I had thought. So um, I need to uh, do more research on Mr. Crowley. But uh, I mean, are they? Is there a, a dichotomy there between like trying to manifest something for you personally and the development of self? Is the, the purpose of spirituality different than the purpose of magic? That's a wonderful question. I personally believe that the Western seeker in many cases has been torn apart by this sense of dichotomy that very often gets visited upon us. We're very often told there's a difference between personality and essence or a difference between the little eye and the big eye or, you know, a difference between the selfish and the spiritual and the Outer life is all illusory, maya, samsara, and non-identification, non-attachment to the outer is, is the, 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 the turnkey to some greater existence, to relating something higher. I question all of that, and I question the way in which it, it gets parroted based upon translation, upon translation, upon translation of ancient spiritual literature, which, while it may have splendid and universal insights, belong to times and places where those points of view may have been very necessary. For example, um, look, in the ancient world or in a caste-based society, um, whether it be in the Near East, whether it be in, in, in Hindustan or wherever the Vedas and the Abrahamic religions emerged from, geographically, socially, a person born into that society was overwhelmingly likely to die within the same caste 
uh, or social strata into which he or she was born. And exiting your caste or social strata was nearly as impossible as um, efforting to walk on the surface of another planet. It, life was so cemented and so regimented by caste, role, social strata. I could very well understand the emphasis placed upon uh, a world that one couldn't see, that this tactile, palpable world of ours is illusion, samsara, a fleeting world filled with little baubles and soap bubbles that we chase after and 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 these things um you know, vanish and 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 our sense of self is is falsely and and catastrophically bound to um the baubles and goodies of outer life mm -hmm. there's a point there and this point has 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 endured with posterity at the same time <clears throat> we are often told but rarely abide the principle to verify things on the path, to verify for ourselves, to really know. And I believe, based on my own search at this point in my life, and I can't fathom that my life is so exceptional from anybody else's, that, in fact, these divisions are false between lower, higher, big self, smaller self, essence, personality, identification, non-identification, attachment, non-attachment. Where would such a line be? be drawn? Where would I cross from having an idea that emanates from essence, an experience that emanates from essence versus personality? Is there some neat line of demarcation? Is there a grayscale? It, it, I don't think it captures life, and it certainly doesn't capture my experience. Dig this. There may be a person out there who needs money for rent, who needs a good car, who needs to move up in uh, his or her career situation, who, who has needs in life that are as concrete and as real as life gets. And who am I to place conditions on what somebody else wants and say, tisk, 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 you're being outer focused. I mean, bullshit. If an individual needs food to eat on their table, or frankly, if an individual wants to be seen and appreciated for an idea they had, a job they did, um, they want to perform their martial arts routine well, they want to pass their bar exam, um, they want to get that 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 job teaching high school English, they need health insurance, whatever it is, you know, who am I to condition that? I want all those things myself. And I've discovered, in fact, that there are areas of life in which I feel much more alive, much more engaged, much more at home in my own skin, much more relaxed in the profoundest sense, such as speaking in public, doing something like you and I are doing right now. And to, to devalue that or say, well, oh, you know, that's just some meaningless soap bubble that I chase after, um, uh, not understanding that, you know, the fuller life is below the glacial surface, the fuller life is below the, the waves on the water, to use all the metaphors that are continually and and I would say <laughs> automatically and habitually uh, employed within tradition, um, I think is a terrible mistake. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a difference between tradition and habit. And uh, habit uh, takes hold uh, very quickly. And we rush to use these little Bartlett's book of spiritual quotations ideas in place of really searching and verifying. I have no reason to assume that somebody wanting to uh, produce something in his or her life needs to be corrected. Yeah. You know, that reminds me of your, uh, in, in your book, you're talking about how do what thou wilt has been misunderstand, uh, misunderstood and abused. Can you uh, go into that? I mean, why? I mean, people sort of get this image of Aleister Crowley as this uh, licentious, abusive, you know, um, addict and abuser. Um, but it's not that simple and do what thou wilt is uh, the way you explain it in the book. Isn't what it's made out to be. Can you sort of give us a, um, a line on that? Sure. And, you know, I would say as a man, um, I think Crowley was all those things. Uh, he was a, a horrible friend. He was disloyal. He was bigoted. Um, he was a nasty son of a bitch in a lot of ways. And I wouldn't have wanted to be on the path with him personally at the same time as an artist 
Crowley was brilliant. Just his persona alone has projected forward across decades and informs so much of our popular culture. Yeah. Um, and and I think uh, a, a lot of his work uh, stands up to posterity, including his what could arguably called his slender masterpiece, uh, the Book of the Law. Um, and the Book of the Law laid out the philosophy of Thelema, a do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. He believed that humanity possesses a true self, um, which gets conditioned and watered down by all the social uh, apparatuses that get visited upon the individual. And that if one can get in touch with this true self, you're living from a place of greater uh, authenticity, productivity, selfhood, this is very similar to ideas that you find in Nietzsche, very similar to ideas that you find in Emerson. It's the whole basis of Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance. If you're a spiritual person, but you don't go in for um, theatrics, um, forget about the book of the law and read Self-Reliance. But I, I Or read both. I think the book of the law, slender work that it is, is a work of true Brilliance. I think it's a work of true brilliance of 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 cut up artistry that is uh, similar in in impact and aesthetic beauty to T. S. Eliot's The Wasteland. There's a lot of people who howl at that and push back against that, but I will tell you this: it's one of the most widely read verse works on earth, uh, coupled with. Uh, Rumi and Shakespeare and T.S. Eliot and Robert Frost and 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 other more contemporary figures. Um, I don't think that that's accidental, and I don't think that that's due to the foolishness of the the public. I think that's <laughs> due to sense of beauty. Um, it's of course a riddle, and it's frustrating that a man who um, hurt a lot of people, um, not physically but but emotionally, and and who I think was a um, a pushy, obstinate, bigoted um, son of a bitch, um, disloyal, um, could produce work of such beauty, but he did. And and it does endure. And there's a reason why John, Paul, George, and Ringo put him on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, think, I think their aesthetic was right. I love it. Yeah. You know, that sort of gets us into the conversation of NHI, non-human intelligences, uh, uh, Crowley um, claimed to have channeled that from an, an other realm intelligence, AWAS, I guess is the, the word. Yeah. Um, and that leads me sort of back to some of the uh, claims of like Blavatsky and stuff with the secret chiefs and the idea that there is this uh, collection of um, entities that are trying to guide human evolution in a way. Um what do you what are your thoughts on that and how do you relate that to the current ufo alien abduction phenomenon do you think there is any connection and to your mind are they the disembodied dead are they extraterrestrial extra dimensional do you have any thoughts well historically blavatsky as you were alluding claimed to be under the tutelage of these hidden adepts and it was very arousing to um, the artistic culture, the intellectual culture, the popular culture, uh, when she was still with us in the 1870s, 1880s, um, and 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 some of her proteges claim to have likewise been in touch with these these hidden adepts, and then it just became a theme that ran throughout the spiritual culture. So the founders of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn claimed uh, secret chiefs. Uh, later on, the term ascended masters came into vogue, used by various American figures. Um, Carlos Castaneda spoke of the hidden sorcerer Don Juan. Um, Neville Goddard, one of my heroes, spoke of tutelage under uh, Abdullah, uh, a black man of Jewish descent in New York City, turban wearing. The story of hidden adepts has become endemic to our alternative spiritual culture. And then Starting in the 1950s, it began to give way to uh, an adjacent narrative, which was about star guests or aliens or extraterrestrial intelligences who were communicating with us and so on. Um, all of this, you know, material is revolving around the idea, you know, as you were saying, of of non-human intelligences. And 
whoever's account can be deemed reliable or unreliable or you know, histrionic or 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 worthy of study, whatever the case, um, I do believe that that thesis is worth exploring. I, I do believe that generation after generation, we simply change the vocabulary words. We might use terms like alien or ET or tall gray today. 150 years ago, somebody might have said spirit or poltergeist or even goblin or, you know, some other term. Um, you know, you go back earlier and it was angel or demon terms that still get used today. By the way, the the negative connotation of the word demon is very culturally conditioned in its original greek demon or daimon was uh, just a spirit an extra physical spirit as was a genie or genii in latin you know, so the romans um and in fact it genie or genii is at the root of our modern term genius the romans believed that that what we call genius was visited upon us by a a non-human intelligence or an invisible helper. Like Look, Pasolka. I mean, Pasolka kind yes, of exactly. yeah, works with that, that idea. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so these ideas have been in circulation not only over the course of human history, but pre-human history. Neanderthal man himself, Neanderthal man himself had a spiritual existence. Um, our Neanderthal ancestors used talismans uh, to help with hunting, for example. Um a bear tooth or an eagle claw. Um, a Neanderthal man fashioned um, little uh, statuettes, which in the 19th century got called um, Venus uh, uh, statuettes. Um, obviously, that term wouldn't have been used, but yeah. but that was the 19th century term. And these are believed to be little statuettes that are supposed to be fertility talismans. They're in the, the shape of a bulbous or impregnated woman. How quick does a person want to be to dismiss all of this stuff, extending not only to primeval human history, but even pre-human history, even among our Neanderthal ancestors? How quick does a modern 21st century person want to be armed with all of his or her logic and digital culture and fluorescent lights to be certain that such things are complete crap, nonsense, delusion, imaginary, and, oh, we've figured out that a certain area of the brain lights up when I think I'm having a spiritual experience. Why, I must give a TED Talk on that. As if that itself is not magic bullet thinking, the determination that because we've identified one thing, that's all that's going on. Exactly it's right. like blind men describing an elephant, you know, the parable. One grabs the tail, thinks it's a snake. One grabs uh, the leg, thinks it's a tree. They're all having palpably accurate experiences, but they're incomplete. One of the maladies of materialist thought is this kind of magic bullet thinking. Materialism's version of what it derisively refers to as magical thinking is that if you've identified one factor, you've identified the whole. So, hooray. I know, you know, that the prefrontal cortex lights up when I think I'm receiving a message from the beyond. So that's all that's happening. It's a physical operation. Well, I don't know that. That may yeah. be one of a dozen things that are happening. That might be what the prayer appeal looks like in the body. Yeah, Just correlation like, is not necessarily causation, right? I mean, like, exactly. yeah, it, it could be the physical... And that goes to the heart of everything. I mean, yeah. boy, we get into that debate and we don't know what's going on ever. You know, and yeah, and we don't is the thing, though. Right? I mean, no. we really don't. <laughs> it's the truth. We, we really don't. And so I believe that that inquiry is a valid inquiry. And yes, um, sure, you know, things happen in the body chemically, stuff lights up. But before I put on my headset and start giving my TED talk, you know, it's 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 worth bearing in mind, right, as you just said, that might be correlation, not causation, or that might be one effect among a dozen effects. So the point I'm making is that based on experience, based on the lab work that I was referencing earlier, based on the persistence of this idea of relating to um, the extra physical, the non-human, as it's persisted across human history and pre-human history, boy, I'd be slow to wanna wanna take away somebody's props if they want to explore that theme. I think it's very worthy of exploring. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm also interested in sort of how you view the occult. Oh, excuse me. 
lost my mic there, um, and how it connects to the UFOs more broadly. Um, you know, there's a couple of things. Uh, Peter Lavenda and his uh, Secret Machines um, books with uh, Tom DeLonge talks about how, uh, you know, UFOs are circular. The magic circle is circular. Is there a connection between the way a magic circle manifests, you know, creatures from that realm to here? is the UFO sort of doing the same thing? Um, and then there's also the story of uh, Jack Parsons having um, summoned the beast uh, as a part of his um, final uh, major work. And that, and then um, and maybe got killed in the process. And that's sort of what we're seeing in terms of the manifesting of UFOs right now. Do you have any thoughts or theories or ideas about how the two might be connected on a fundamental level? It seems to me, you know, apropos of what we were just discussing, that the UFO discussion and the occult discussion are converging. And they, it, the time is here, you know, for those things to really converge. I'm not talking about UFO-based religions necessarily or anything of that nature. Rather, the, I'm talking of the phenomena. Mm -hmm. if, yes. if we're interested, uh, like, okay, the metaphysical seeker is interested in non-human intelligence as well. You know, so is the person probing the UFO thesis. Uh, he or she is very concerned with the question of whether there is uh, engineered intelligent phenomena uh, anomalously uh, showing up in reportage, in evidence, including in physical evidence and so forth. And, and how, how do we understand this phenomena? Is it extraterrestrial? Well, we have models for extraterrestriality, um, but but I would say that we have better developed models, and again, these are not reality, these are just conceptions of reality, but we have better developed models of interdimensionality than we do of extraterrestriality. In fact, I would say that the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, the many worlds experiment, uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum physics, whereby it's necessitated that a infinite number of things are playing out at once and measurement localizes, measurement localizes. If that's applicable to our broader lives, then I would say it's a logical necessity that perspective is selecting. I was saying earlier that our senses are nothing other than biological methods of measurement what else do we do with our senses i hear things i smell things i touch things um the information that i pick up over my senses can be conveyed in part over digital uh, media like we're doing right now so okay you know we don't have a sense of palpable touch we don't have a sense of depth we don't have a sense of uh, smell but we know what's going on we can hear one another communicate with one another pick up on emotions and so on um, these are these are tools of measurement. In as much as we're localizing through measurement in a lab, and this includes, I'm not limiting myself strictly to um, the quantum lab, but these things are true in other fields of study as well, including psychical research. Um, we may be selecting among, um, relating to things that are occurring in different intersections of time or different dimensions. This is an aspect of what is called string theory, where everything that is a thing exists on these undulating bands of strings and that something perhaps that goes on uh, on one of these bands of strings that I'm unable to um, access from a sensory perspective is nonetheless affecting stuff that's going on within my sphere of data. Yeah, um, dark matter. I mean, dark, dark matter, matter does that uh, as far as we know, um, and that's acknowledged, yeah. you know. And and all kinds of things that we can't necessarily see, like velocity, affects our, per not our perception of time, but objectively affects time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Einstein theorized, and it's since been proven, that time bends in extreme conditions of velocity, of gravity, and not metaphorically, or not just in terms of perception, but actually and really uh, aging, the aging process for our astronauts in our own era, although they're obviously traveling nowhere near the velocity of light speed, the aging process for astronauts in our own era um, slows down in minute 
but measurable ways. These yeah. things are absolute reality. Linear time is not an absolute. Einstein has been proven. So we have all this material that emerges from the world-class science of the 20th century. And here we find ourselves in the 21st century with increasing amounts of data, partly because media has just gotten better. Our tools of measurement have gotten better. Why do we experience these things? Are they real? Where are they from? Um, what about that that nagging uh, little single digit percentage that cannot be explained by any uh, mundane or or common cause or observation? These are the questions of our era, the questions of our era. And it seems to me that we mustn't get caught up with vocabulary terms. One guy says ET, another guy says demigod or non you know, non human intelligence one guy says poltergeist another guy says you know take your pick these are all just generational terms they're metaphors that we slap on things that we can't understand so we have to use metaphors in general terms or or terms that are in vogue just because they're placeholders and we need to be able to communicate but we're all talking about the same thing which is something that shouldn't be there according to the materialistic foundations of our education, but is there and keeps on showing up there. And we have more and more theories justifying its possibility. We have more and more data justifying its possibility. So I think the discussion around occultism and UFOs, um, if it's to be vibrant, it must uh, come together. Um, one, I have two more questions. Uh, so to give you, a, we're, we're almost at the end here. Um, do you believe that humanity's consciousness is evolving are we entering the age of horus or the age of aquarius or is that a you know us trying to put a linear character on the random flows and of evolution this is a big area in which i differ from much of the new age and i do not use new age in a derogatory way i apply the term to myself to me new age is a radically ecumenical culture of therapeutic spirituality that's what it is I'm a part of it. So I don't use it as an epithet. But I disagree with the New Age culture, many precincts of the New Age culture on this point. I do not see an evolution in the human consciousness or situation. Uh, there may be greater capacities that we're entering into, but I don't see the development that really should be there. I think that we are very buffered off from uh, our own violations of other people's um, needs. Um, we are very um, steeped in illusion about our own capacity to tell the truth, to keep our word, to uh, show up on time, do what we say that we're going to do. Um, there's a terrible paucity of loyalty, solidarity, honesty, nobility. Um, these things are considered quaint. Yeah. They're considered silly, sentimental, embarrassing. Um, people who crow about social justice and yet who can't be trusted to water a houseplant, that doesn't connote any kind of human progress to me. Uh, I think that that we, we suffer the illusion of progress. There are certainly advances, um, but I think that, that the imperative know thyself, I don't think we've made progress. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost as if by positing the idea that we are evolving or on the edge of some massive evolution, then we take our uh, own agency out of it. Like we don't have to work for it because it's just about right. to happen anyway. And so maybe that, uh, you know, eases the pressure that we should be applying in order to make that evolution actually occur. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier on in the interview. You were like, there's ver very little of, of ancient wisdom um, has reached us. Like the, uh, and um, that's true that more and more has come out. But I mean, I think that overall, the um, we have barely, you know, just the uh, smallest hints of what the actual depth and breadth of, of that thinking was. But I, I wonder, I mean, like, you know, we have um, people talk a lot um, about Hermeticism and Gnosticism and um, Kabbalah and all of these things. And they use these as a basis to try and construct a new worldview that is a little bit more fulfilling and a little bit more, uh, a little less alienating than the one that we currently live in. But I worry that in some sense, we're abusing those traditions and not really understanding them. For instance, you know, Gnosticism and Hermeticism are not equivalent. I mean, they are dramatically different worldviews, but people don't really know that necessarily. 
So I, I guess, I mean, are we, what is the risk of sort of abusing these traditions? And do you think it's it's still worth it? And how do we sort of um, flesh those out so that we can get more out of them? I mean, what are your thoughts on, on, on using that kind of stuff as a way to build something new? It's so little of ancient tradition has really reached us. I mean, we're just grasping at fragments and threads. I mean, the discovery of the um, Nagamati Gnostic writings in 1945 was a, a huge find and, and opened up so much. And yet just think of what a thread it is, you know, these, yeah. these scrolls on um, uh, parchment were wrapped up and put in a jar, buried for safekeeping. How many of those jars have we never found? Exactly and right. We are in such a tough spot because, look, I'm very dedicated to Hermeticism, and yet <clears throat> the original Greek manuscripts or parchment scrolls um, that compose the, the Corpus Hermeticum, the main body of Hermetic writings that animated the Renaissance mind, we don't even got those anymore. We don't know where they are, you know. For God's sake, somebody might have fucking used them, you know, to wrap fish or something. I mean, the the abuses and the mishandling of historic material, the theft, the piracy, um, the the burning, the the destruction, it's horrible. So, you know, it's difficult for us to even evaluate what were those Greek manuscripts? When were they written down? You know, that's part of what I'm re referencing when I talk of translation of translation. We have no idea what a disadvantageous viewpoint we have apropos of our ancient past. It's not even until fairly recently that we've had good serviceable English translations of Hermetic material. I think it's only in 1992 since Brian Copenhaver published a, a, a book called Hermetica for Cambridge University Press. I think that's our first really hardcore um, quality uh, translation. And before then, you had some musty Victorian translations. I shouldn't say musty. I mean, there were some extraordinary efforts made, including through G.R.S. Mead, who was yeah. a great scholar and a secretary to Madame Blavatsky. And we stand on the shoulders of Mead and so on, but we only have these translations that are truly serviceable for 21st century people uh, recently. And stuff has been neglected, lost, destroyed, um, infused with the prejudice and the point of view of people, including in antiquity, who themselves wanted to promulgate their own outlook. They may have been Christian, they may have been pagan, they may have been Gnostic, they may have been Hermetic, and they infused some of this stuff with their own pet points of view. So yeah. it's hard to say, you know, we're always on our knees staring through a keyhole. Freemasonry has been an attempt to preserve some of the material from the occult Renaissance, which in turn was an attempt to preserve material from antiquity. Look, you see the same effort in Mormonism, you know, quite frankly, Joseph Smith borrowed certain ideas from Freemasonry. He felt that they hearkened to the ancient rites of the Hebrew priests. And we don't know. There's so little that reaches us. Even the Jewish liturgy itself, which people sometimes think is ancient, it's certainly based on ancient sources, but it goes back to the Middle Ages, which is really old. But yeah. it's, it's not antiquity as we understand it. So. Yeah. We're all at a disadvantage, you know, and I think we we try to find material that's meaningful, that speaks to us, and the individual has to go through some effort, and it can be very, very long effort of, of self-verification to see if certain ideas are making any kind of a difference in, in his or her life. There, there have been teachers, including G.I. Gurji, who I think were tapped into ideas of a certain vintage that are enormously valuable. And so sometimes, you know, we we get lucky, quite frankly, and there's a time capsule or a, a find is made like Nagamati. And, um, you know, we have some additional threads or fragments. That's what we have to work with. Yeah, it seems like I think that that uh, should discourage sort of the fundamentalist view of looking at some of these writings and saying this is the absolute truth or or the law and understand that there may be ideas there that we can use, but they shouldn't be, um, you know, accepted whole cloth without uh, any kind of critical. Um, I, I totally agree. We're all in the same boat in this respect. You know, we really are. Um, we don't have these source materials. We have very, very interrupted and jagged thread and a lot of stuff that's not reached us at all there uh just one last aside is so 
would you say that you don't believe the idea that there has been a line of, you know, continuity between some of the some ancient wisdom and some, you know, maybe hidden uh, occult uh, groups that may have knowledge? People talk about sometimes that the Rosicrucians may have a line that goes all the way back. Do you think that that could be true at all, or is that just legend? Well, ancient retentions, I think, if they exist, they're very, very uncommon. Yeah. So much has been destroyed. Look, even in this country, um, there is a, um, a an African American based magical tradition called hoodoo, which was assembled not voodoo, with which it's often confused, but sure. hoodoo with an H, with with which um, which was a a, a kind of um, very fluid, porous magical tradition that was pieced together by embondaged uh, people um, in the American colonies, in the American nation, and who do endures uh, its practices endure. You can you can visit botanicas and other shops that sell hoodoo supplies. There was a big debate here in America in, among sociologists in the early 20th century about whether hoodoo retained ideas from actual African practice, whether the West African coastal states um, um, had a spirituality, a tradition, a mythology that still showed up within hoodoo. And there were a lot of sociologists who argued um, that the trauma and the, the centuries-long uh, experience of slavery was just too disruptive to allow for retentions, and some did argue for retentions. I think the argument nowadays is in favor of, of some retentions, and I think that's absolutely defensible. In fact, you can find hoodoo rituals that relate to uh, practices that, that, that go back with some vintage in um, Nigeria, you know, for example. So I think there have been retentions. But I say that just to say that this stuff is all post-ancient, you know, and, and it's really hard, even though it's right here in America with practitioners who spoke uh, English out of necessity and um, and were, were practicing things, some of which got written down, some of which got passed on an oral tradition. And, and, and inquirers are saying, well, gee, does this relate to stuff that existed in the coastal states, West Africa, Central Africa? And it's really hard to sort out. And it, it, it caused a flaming debate. All the more difficult to argue about stuff that might be millennia old, millennia old with vast differences in language and custom and, and so on. So I think that, that um, there may be retentions of a very general sort. Uh, there may be some authentic threads from antiquity that we have been able to vouchsafe, I would never rule that out. But I think that um, I think out of romance and out of a wish to really connect with our ancient past, uh, we sometimes overestimate the the fineness, the actuality of of retentions from antiquity. Whereas the thread, it gets so frayed, so broken, so interrupted. Um, it's it's an argument that I, I would approach with great caution. Yeah. That's all I have for you, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time out. This was a fantastic conversation. Pleasure. And thank you for your questions. They were so informed and, and great. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. I, uh, I love your work and I will continue reading. So maybe we'll be able to speak at some point again in the future. I'd be delighted.